We begin this chapter by reviewing this figure. The figure is going to compare two very important CNS drugs, and that would be barbiturates and benzodiazepines. It's going to look at a dose response curve, showing you the increasing doses of those drugs and their CNS depressant effects. In fact, if you start at the very bottom of the diagram, you can see that at low doses, benzos and barbs are going to have a sedative effect, an anti-anxiety effect, anti-convulsant effects, and even muscle relaxant activities at lower doses. If I increase the dose of those drugs, I can get a hypnotic effect. These drugs can certainly be used to help your patient sleep more effectively. If I increase the dose even further, I can get an anesthetic effect from these drugs. But you'll notice that those anesthetic doses, that's where the curves diverge. The curve for the benzodiazepines begins to flatten out, whereas the curve for the barbiturates continues to rise very steeply. This points out one of the distinct advantages of a benzodiazepine over a barbiturate. Simply put, benzodiazepines are a safer group of drugs because of this flatter dose response curve. What it means on overdose is that if I overdose on a benzo, I'm likely to get some minor medullary depression. On the other hand, compare that to overdose of a barbiturate. With a much steeper dose response curve, I'm likely to go right past medullary depression into coma, perhaps all the way to death. That steep dose response curve makes this a much more dangerous group of drugs and clinically speaking, much less useful. When you study CNS pharmacology, my recommendation is to think about each of our chapters in our book by the type of neurotransmitter that that chapter deals with. So follow the note at the bottom of this slide, study by transmitter. As we look at chapter one and think about sedative hypnotic drugs, you should be thinking about GABA as the major transmitter because this is how many of these drugs in this chapter are going to work. So let's take a look at the GABA-A complex shown in this figure. GABA-A contains five subunits. You see those labeled in the diagram, alpha, beta, gamma, and a couple of other subunits. But most importantly, the GABA-A complex is a chloride channel. GABA has its own distinct binding site. Benzodiazepines have a separate and distinct binding site from GABA. Barbiturates have their own binding site. You might also make a note that alcohol also will bind somewhere on the GABA-A complex, and that is also a distinct site compared to benzos, barbs, and GABA. Whether it's GABA-A or GABA-B, both of these types of receptors are going to be an inhibitory effect. Both result in membrane hyperpolarization. GABA-A activation increases chloride ion influx, whereas GABA-B activation is going to increase potassium efflux. Again, both actions are inhibitory. Let's look at benzodiazepines and specifically focus on their mechanism. This is a classic mechanism that you must be familiar with. Benzos are going to potentiate GABA. If you remember from our earlier discussion, Back in general principles, we discuss the concept of potentiation. Do you remember what the dose response curve looks like when you're dealing with potentiation? That's right, the curve is going to shift to the left. Remember, GABA all by itself, and then benzos plus GABA will shift that GABA dose response curve to the left, essentially indicating an increase in potency. Let's dig into exactly how benzos are going to work. When benzos bind to their specific binding site on the GABA-A complex, they will increase the frequency of chloride channel opening. That is the mechanism you must highlight. Benzos have no GABA mimicking activity. Another way to say that is that a benzo will have no effect without GABA being present. Benzos are going to act through BZ receptors. These are subdivided into BZ1 and BZ2. If you make it simple, BZ1 can be the sleep receptor. It mediates the sedative effects of benzodiazepines. Whereas BZ2 mediates all of the other actions of a benzodiazepine. That would include anti-anxiety effects and impairment of cognitive functions. So BZ1 versus BZ2. If you look in the margin, there's a note about the drug called flumazenil. 
Flumazenil is used as an antidote for benzodiazepines because it can quickly reverse the action of benzos. This drug, flumazenil, blocks both BZ1 and BZ2 receptors. But importantly, flumazenil is not an antidote for barbiturates or alcohol. And the reason is barbiturates have a separate binding site. Barbiturates don't bind to BZ1 or BZ2, nor does alcohol. Therefore, flumazenil cannot serve as an antidote for those drugs. If you compare the mechanism of benzodiazepines to barbiturates, you notice that the barbiturates will increase the duration of chloride channel opening. Not the frequency this time, rather, it's the duration of chloride channel opening. A way to remember this is to take the word barbiturate and substitute the T with a D. Forming the word barbidurate, that reminds you that it's duration of chloride channel opening that is affected by benzodiazepines. Here's another difference between benzos and barbs. Barbiturates have GABA mimicking activity at high doses, and this possibly explains why that dose response curve for the barbiturates is so steep. Because even if you deplete GABA, the barbiturate can continue to bind and activate the GABA A complex, increasing that duration of chloride channel opening, you continue to get a response, possibly contributing to further CNS depression. Barbs don't work through BZ receptors. They've got their own binding site. Next, let's look at the uses for benzodiazepines. As I look at the various drugs in this table, all of the benzos that we really need to be familiar with have a common ending. If you'll notice, they're lambs and PAMs. Drugs like alprazolam or diazepam, lorazepam, lambs and PAMs is a common ending for a benzodiazepine. Look for those three letters. When I look at the drugs, let's start with alprazolam. It's a very important drug that can be used for acute anxiety. Emphasis on acute because benzodiazepines have a rapid onset. That's what makes them useful for folks who have panic attacks. Their rapid onset makes them beneficial in acute anxiety situations. If you compare diazepam to a drug a little farther down in the table, middazolam, Diazepam is a long-acting benzodiazepine, whereas midazolam is a short-acting drug. Diazepam is useful for a variety of conditions, including anxiety as a preoperative sedative drug, muscle relaxation, and even for withdrawal states. On the other hand, short-acting drugs like midazolam make good IV anesthetics. The other three drugs in the table, lorazepam, temazepam, and oxazepam, all have a special pharmacokinetic property, which we'll discuss on a later slide. You also see a note at the bottom of the slide indicating the effects of benzodiazepines on the sleep stages. They're going to increase stage two sleep, but decrease REM and stage three. Again, these drugs can be used for sleep disorders, but they impact sleep stages. When we look at the pharmacokinetics of benzodiazepines, the rule is these drugs are metabolized by the liver, most often to active compounds. So many times the benzo is going to have perhaps multiple active metabolites. But there are three exceptions. The drugs oxazepam, temazepam, and lorazepam. And a way to remember these three as an exception is to take the first letter of each drug's name. You have O, T, L. And you can remember the phrase. You can remember outside the liver. Outside the liver means these drugs are conjugated extrahepatically. They are metabolized outside of the liver. So what is really the special property of these drugs? They're safe in patients with liver dysfunction and in the elderly. Remember, in the elderly, as you get older, perhaps you're also starting to develop some liver dysfunction. So what we notice about these three drugs, because they're handled outside of the liver, we can use them in certain patient populations. Of the three, make sure you're very, very confident in the drug lorazepam and the fact that it is a key drug that we use and it is metabolized extrahepatically. When we think about the uses of barbiturates, their use overall has been dramatically reduced over the last 10 to 20 years. We still use the drug phenobarbital for seizures, and we will see it in a later chapter in our CNS section. 
when we think about the pharmacokinetics of barbiturates, they are metabolized by the liver occasionally to active compounds. That's not as important a point as the fact that phenobarbital is a classic P450 inducer. So if a patient is taking this drug, they have to be aware of possible drug interactions and the fact that phenobarbital as an inducer is likely to lower the plasma levels of that second drug that they're taking. Barbiturates are contraindicated in porphyrias. This is because they can induce the production of porphyrins. You can definitely develop tolerance and dependence to your sedative hypnotics. In fact, chronic use leads to tolerance and there can be cross tolerance between the GABA drugs. So benzos, barbs, and ethanol, you can develop a cross tolerance with those drugs. Both psychological and physical dependence can occur, but overall, the abuse liability of benzos is less than ethanol or barbiturates. The withdrawal signs of a benzo include rebound insomnia and anxiety, perhaps even seizures when the benzos are used as anti-epileptic drugs or if they're used in high doses. It's not that difficult to imagine the withdrawal signs of a benzodiazepine because benzos are GABA drugs and GABA is a depressing CNS neurotransmitter. Therefore, the withdrawal is going to look very stimulatory, insomnia and anxiety. The withdrawal signs of barbiturates and ethanol are going to have some similar characteristics to benzos, including anxiety, possible agitation. But these side effects are going to be more severe and possibly life-threatening with barbiturates and ethanol. Could include life-threatening seizures. Delirium tremens, the DTs, occur with alcohol. Importantly, how do you manage withdrawal, especially if you're dealing with ethanol withdrawal? This is a possible step one question. You want to use supportive care, clearly, but long-lasting benzodiazepines can be an important part of your management of the withdrawal state from ethanol. If you think about this, it's a strategy where you're using a safer GABA drug, benzos, to help you to overcome the withdrawal symptoms from the more dangerous GABA drug, ethanol. When you consider drug interactions, it's important to remember that all GABA drugs are CNS depressants. So clearly, if you combine GABA drugs, you can get an additive effect. But if you mix a GABA drug with another CNS depressant, and several of those are listed on this slide, anesthetics, antihistamines, opiates, beta blockers, you can get an additive effect that can lead to possible life-threatening respiratory depression. We have some non-benzodiazepine drugs we should consider as well. This includes the drugs Zolpidem, Zaliplon, and even the drug Ezopiclone. These are BZ1 receptor agonists. They are specific for BZ1 with less effect on BZ2 receptors. That means these drugs are going to have less effect on cognitive function. Being BZ1 selective, they are useful in sleep disorders. The BZ1 receptor, after all, is the sleep receptor. As a group, these non-benzodiazepine drugs that work through BZ1 have less effect on sleep stages compared to the benzos. Here's a question for you. Name some drugs that can be antidoted by flumazenil, but those drugs are not benzodiazepines. Remember, a wrong answer would be barbiturates or ethanol but a correct answer would be Zolpidem or Zaliplon or Ezopiclone, the Z drugs, if you will. Of course, if you want to get some sleep, how about taking one of the Z drugs to help you get some Zs? Overall, because of a less effect on BZ2 receptors, you're going to see less tolerance and abuse liability with these drugs. The final drug in this chapter is a non-benzodiazepine drug called Buspirol. This drug is very, very different from all of the other drugs covered in this chapter. It's the only drug in the chapter that's not a GABA drug. In fact, this drug is a serotonin drug. It's a 5-HT1A partial agonist. Because it's a serotonin drug and not a GABA drug, it's not a CNS depressant. It has a different set of properties compared to the other drugs we've covered. It can be used for generalized anxiety disorders. Because it's not a CNS depressant, it doesn't have sedative effects like you would expect from GABA drugs. You don't get the CNS depression, 
You don't get tolerance. If there is a downside to this drug, it's that it takes one to two weeks before it starts to work. So it does have a slow onset. As we conclude this chapter, let's look at a couple of flow charts. The first one is going to deal with a flow chart for the treatment of anxiety. I reminded you earlier to think about our CNS chapters in terms of neurotransmitters. So if we're going to treat the condition of anxiety, there are two neurotransmitters that you should be thinking about, GABA and serotonin. The most commonly used GABA drugs for anxiety, benzodiazepines. The serotonin drugs would include SSRIs, our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and buspirone, the drug we just covered. The difference in the treatment of anxiety relates to the onset of activity for these drugs. GABA is going to have a rapid onset. So if you want to treat acutely, then GABA drugs like benzos are very, very important. On the other hand, chronic management most often involves SSRIs. Whether it's an SSRI or buspirone, serotonin drugs are going to have a slow onset of generally a couple of weeks before they begin working. So remember the phrase, serotonin is slow in the treatment of anxiety. It's why we oftentimes will start a patient off on a benzodiazepine and an SSRI at the same time. We treat them with both drugs for several weeks, and then we discontinue the benzodiazepine. The rationale? We allow the SSRI time to begin working, and the benzo is there to cover in the interim. The other flowchart that we want to look at is for sleep disorders. Most often we're thinking about GABA drugs for sleep disorders, though occasionally you want to think about melatonin. And there's a melatonin derivative called rameltion that can be used and is sometimes used for patients who have trouble sleeping. If we think about the GABA drugs, we really have two choices here, benzodiazepines and those we called disease, including zolpidem and zaloplon. So this flowchart should help you to organize the drugs in terms of their mechanisms.